And as we speak right now, where should we camp next is the number one family travel guide in the country. And where should we camp next national parks is the number two family travel guide in the country. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the RV Atlas. It's book release week, or it's almost book release week, (laughs) because this podcast is coming out on Friday. Book release comes out Tuesday. Yeah, so we had a book release week, and now we have another book release week, right? So a lot of book release weeks coming on in this month. This is a lot. A lot of books. We had a book book re-release week, and now we're having a book release week. (laughs) Yeah. So... Um, our fourth book comes out Tuesday. We're putting out this podcast Friday. Our fourth book, Where Should We Camp Next? National Parks, comes out on Tuesday. It'll be available in bookstores across the country. If you haven't pre-ordered it yet, please pre-order because that helps immensely. But I think let's just like like dive in. Like Our topic today is 35 tips for taking RV trips to national parks. And that's pulled from the introduction of the book. But let's just give everyone a broad sense of like, what is this book? Why should like everybody on planet Earth buy this book, at least if you like to camp around National Yeah, so we kind of expanded this series, right, of where should we camp next with this book? And this is where should we camp next? National Parks. So we were like, okay, the first book, people really love the recommendations for state by state camping. And now we're going to give recommendations for National Park trips in this book. And the thing that we did that's really important to, you know, let everybody know is we didn't just cover like the classic. I always lose track of what number it is. Is it 62 now? What number is like the NPS number There's now? There's 62 national parks. Okay. There's well over right. 100 national park campgrounds in different types of national park units. Right. So what we did was we said, "Hey, which are all of the national park units like lake shores and seashores and historical um sites and battlefields and all that kind of good stuff which are the best ones for camping trips right because there's some of those like 62 national parks that aren't great for camping to be honest and then and there's there- other places like national seashores that are amazing for camping so we and really national wanted to focus in on the camping yeah, yeah yeah so it was it's a bro- and i i joke that the book should be called where should we camp next national park units but that doesn't yeah. roll off the tongue <laughs> which doesn't sound great but it's true <laughs> because we're looking at all the national park units all the different types of national park units and saying which ones make for awesome rv and tent camping and glamping vacations And then like the structure of the book is really cool. And I don't think there's anything else like that. We review the campgrounds inside the parks, Mm -hmm. if there are campgrounds inside the parks. And there's a, there's a couple cases where there's actually not campgrounds inside the national park units. And then we review. Yeah. And the Gettysburg. And then we review the campgrounds outside of the park, because we know that a lot of people just stay inside the parks. A lot of people just stay outside the parks for their full hookups and their KOAs or whatever. Uh, And then a lot of people do both. And there's not really a resource that shows you like all of the options in and around the national parks. And we did all the iconic famous ones. You're not going to open this book and be like, where's Yosemite? You know, it's those are all in there. But then there's like all of these other NPS units that you might not think of as being great for national park vacations. So there's all the campground reviews. And then there's the sidebars, which people really seem to like, which have recommendations for food and activities and books to read before you go and and all kinds of fun stuff that kind of helps you get inspired. And Stephanie, I'm going to lay this out right now. I'm going to make a claim. I think this is a better book. I think this is a much better book than the first Where Should We Camp Next book. Do Do you know why I think that? I know why I think that, but I don't know why you think that. Well, who, who goes first? I'll, I'll, I'll give my opinion and we'll Go see ahead. if it matches up. So I think this is because, first of all, we had the first book and we listened to feedback, right? So people love that book. It sold really well. It has great reviews, but we're really open to feedback. And the number one piece of feedback was that they just, everybody wished there was more campground. And we agree. Like, it was really hard to do a 50-state book. We were over our word limit as it was. It wasn't like we didn't want to include a lot of campgrounds, but you're just dealing with 50 states, so it's hard. With this one, I think we were, like, determined to really squeeze in as many campgrounds that were great as possible. So I do think that that was something we targeted. That's 100% why I like this book better. 
it's hard to do justice oh. to a state by reviewing six to nine campgrounds. Um, yeah. It's not hard to do justice to a national park by reviewing six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven campgrounds. And we did try to get more in, but you can just this book feels more complete. It feels like yeah. it, it's up to it. Or the no, job. not complete, comprehensive. Comprehensive. How about that? Comprehensive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Who called? Somebody called you comprehensive once, and it was sort of like a. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I remember. I don't remember who it was. So he was like, she's very comprehensive. Comprehensive. And it was like, I can't remember who said that, but I totally remember that. It's like a compliment, but not not a compliment. So I. It's a euphemism. Yeah. And and actually, what we did too is take a national park that has tons of campgrounds, like Yellowstone or even, even like Shenandoah National Park has a lot of campgrounds. You know, we review our favorites, the one we've been to, the ones we've stayed at, the most popular ones. And then if we don't review it, we at least list it and say, here are the other campgrounds inside the park. So this is going to give you an incredible snapshot of your best options for national park vacations by RV, by tent, by cabin, or by glamping. I think it's a really good book. And as we speak right now, Where Should We Camp Next is the number one family travel guide in the country. And Where Should We Camp Next National Parks is the number two family travel guide in the country. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's exciting. And <laughs> you know, like I, I posted and said, like, writing books is a grind. You know, like we're inside. We're writing about something we love doing. And by definition, not doing it. Uh, it's hard. And we, we're constantly asking ourselves if we should write another book or is it worth it to write these books? And then when they come out and they do well and they get a response, it's really, really nice. So thank you to everybody who's buying copies. Um, I don't have anything else to say in our intro here, Stephanie, if you're ready. No, somebody, yeah, it was somebody, I just say somebody famous, was it like Eudora Welty or one of those really famous writers once said like, I hate writing. I love having written or like, I love Dorothy having Parker, written books and I think that we feel one of, yes, a Famous women writer said that, and I've never identified with a statement more. So, but but now we have written, we have published. This is the book. Let's dive into the tips, okay? Yeah. So we'll be back in a second. We're going to give you thirty-five tips, and we're going to run through them quickly. Thirty-five tips for taking RV trips to national parks. It's sort of pulled from the intro to where should we camp next national parks. But before we do that, we have a sponsored message from our friends at Yogi Bears Jellystone Park Camp Resorts. And they've got quite a few good ones outside of national parks. So we'll be back in a second with 35 tips for visiting them. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's Stephanie and Jeremy from the RV Atlas, the co-hosts of this show. And we're giving you 35 tips for planning an RV trip to national parks. Though it could be a tent camping trip. It could be a cabin camping trip or it could be a glamping trip. And these are all pulled from the introductory materials of Where Should We Camp Next National Parks. So it's a little sneak peek of the book, but we'll also make it super, super useful. So tip number one, you need to decide if you want to camp inside the park, outside the park, or some combination of both. Stephanie, do you have any Mm -hmm. wisdom to give, particularly to like first time RV owners for how to approach this? Yeah. So I would say to people, don't tell yourself that one is necessarily always better than the other, right? Be open-minded. Don't listen to what other people tell you to do. I'll never forget the funniest email we ever received where somebody like emailed us and said that they were sorry for our children, that they were not sleeping because we were going to too many. We were going to too many (laughs) KOAs in Jellystone, and he and this person wrote and said, "I feel bad for you." Yeah, they felt bad for me. Do not, do not let anybody tell you to camp like they do. Right? Like, think about what makes sense for you all. And for us, it's different every time we've stayed inside plenty of national parks and we've also stayed outside. And I will tell you like Glacier, leaving the park after hiking all day and going back to the KOA and West Glacier and soaking in that hot tub. Amazing. Just amazing. Um, So really think about what you want. Don't necessarily think one is always better than the other. Yeah, and I I like doing both. So I would recommend thinking you know, like camp inside the national park where you probably don't have hookups for three or four nights and then go to the private campground outside of the park where you're going to have full hookups so you can dump your tanks. That's a, a nice way to do it too is to combo it. Now, once you've decided if you're inside the park or outside the park or some combination of both, you still have decisions to make. You still have to decide what kind of campground you want. So that's tip two. And I think that what we meant here was whether you're in the park or outside of the park, you can be close to the action or far away from the action. 
And that's a decision. Yeah, or you have connected. To make too. You know, like you can have you can look for a campground with Wi Fi or you can look for a campground with hookups. You know, there's gonna be campgrounds that are more affordable. Some people are like, I just want a base camp because I'm gonna be in the national park all day, but I want hookups. So you find a really simple forty dollar a night private campground outside the national park and just plug your RV in. Other people want more of the amenities, want food to maybe come home to at the end of the day, want dog walking. That's another thing. Like, do you want things like that while you're in the park all day? So think about that. Think about driving proximity to the to the gates of the campground because uh, of the national park, because honestly, people sometimes newbies are surprised at how long it takes to get into a national park on any given day. And then there can be a wait at the gate. So tip number three, um, just giving you some advice on how to make reservations. Now, the dates when reservations open up for both campgrounds inside the park and campgrounds outside the park will vary. But if you're looking at the campgrounds inside the national parks, you go to the NPS uh, website and you'll start to, to read about it and you realize, I can't make reservations here. And there's usually some small little tab like click here for reservations, and that's going to take you outside of, of the NPS website, and that's going to take you to recreation.gov right mm -hmm. um yeah. and there there will be often be more information and you'll be able to book um so that's how it works for inside the parks now outside of the parks it just totally it, it's the wild west everybody's a little it's bit the wild different. west <laughs> but i have to say like you gotta understand how early people book in how early these reservation windows open for inside i saw a person post in our group just a month ago or so that was like I'm trying to book for the summer at Glacier inside the park, and it looks like there's nothing available because the booking window for Glacier was whatever, eight months, whatever it was, that booking window had passed. She had no chance of getting one of the reservable campgrounds. I mean, she could look for cancellations or whatever, but it was snapped up. That's how it works. So if you're late to the party, you're not going to get a site. Get on it. Now, what about... First come, first served campground options. There are some site. There can be a campground where part of the sites are reservable, and then there's another mm -hmm. section of sites that are first come, first served. Um, I don't know if I want to make this a tip, but we don't do that. <laughs> okay, if we're traveling well, it, to a national park, we don't do those first come, first served. Maybe somebody. Maybe it works yeah. for somebody else. I've just said always said to everybody, know thyself. Like if it's going to stress you out. Why would you do that? There's some people that love the challenge and they love knowing what time is checkout, 10 a.m. and they're lining up. We, we've seen it in the national parks. We've seen people lining up outside the campgrounds to get that site that opens up when somebody leaves. But um, it's tricky. And most people who are even the best at it will say have a backup because we haven't gotten in a bunch of times to the one that we wanted. You have to be a super flexible person and you also have to know what are you going to do if you don't get a site? What's your plan for us traveling with kids? That's just never been worth it. We'd always rather have like a guaranteed place to stay. But most national parks will have some campgrounds that are reservable and some that aren't. So some people like to say, well, I'll reserve and then maybe I'll try to get into this amazing campground, right? Like, so there's lots of ways that people game the system. But either way, don't do something. If you're going to be sitting there crying because you didn't get a site, don't do that. <laughs> Book somewhere else. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, tip number five. We do think, even though you should buy a copy of Where Should We Camp Next National Parks, that you should use online reviews and check out online reviews because you might narrow it down to two or three campgrounds and this is your big family vacation to Glacier, Yellowstone, Yosemite, and you can't figure out, oh, do I want to stay at this KOA or that KOA or this National Park Service campground? Um, online reviews can be very useful, and we say that with a grain of salt, right? Yeah, so definitely our every campground in this book is great for someone, right? We don't have campgrounds in this book that aren't good campgrounds. So they're all great campgrounds for some people. They may not be a great campground for you. So this is what kind of like tip five and six are both kind of combined together. So use online reviews to get a more comprehensive idea of whether this campground is for you. Like when you read our review, you're like, okay, that sounds nice. Here. Now I'll go on and narrow it down between these two or three. But then six is like, take the review seriously. Like when sometimes we see the same review over and over and over again, you want to say like, what were these people thinking? Like, okay, like people have been saying that it's a party palace for a year. 
It's a party and you palace. went and then complained that it was <laughs> a party. If palace, there's a theme like... to the reviews. Take those. Yeah. That, seriously. Yeah. I was just reading reviews of a state park in Florida where 10 of the reviews said there's a massive rat problem and tent campers were saying rats had eaten mm. through their tents. So like, yeah. Oh, gross. I wouldn't tent camp there, right? So like, like take, take that seriously. Don't go there. Yeah. Unless you like rats. Some people like rats. I don't know. But look, but then tip seven, look for reviews from people who have a similar camping style mm-hmm. to you. So if you're a tent camper, look at the reviews from the tent campers. Because they might complain and say, oh, I was right next to an RV with the generator going. I was surrounded by RVs. Okay, so that that might matter to you. But if you're an RV owner, that review doesn't matter to you because you're going to be one of the RV owners and you're not going to feel the noise from the other RVs because you're in an enclosed unit yourself. So kind That's of the reviews. That's true for cabin reviews especially. So what happens is sometimes a campground will have negative reviews for a cabin because they don't do well at like the cabin cleaning kind of a thing that has nothing to do with whether or not their RV sites are nice or the location or the amenities. So just make sure that you don't just look at a star rating because sometimes those reviews can be really mixed. And that, that flows into tip number eight, pay attention to specific amenities that are critiqued. So you might see a um, a campground that gets a lot of negative hits because the bathrooms are not clean that you're going to see that over and over again, a campground reviews, the bathrooms are not clean. The bathrooms are not clean. Well, yeah. if you have a self-enclosed RV, you might never use those bathrooms. Like if we let that, dis- you know, if that made us decide not to camp in Badlands National Park for our family, that would have been tragic because we loved camping in Badlands National Park <laughs> at Cedar yeah. Pass, I think it's called. And Cedar yeah, the bathrooms, Pass. But the bathrooms oh, were filthy. Good, are... disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> but we had a bathroom in the RV. So that didn't yeah. that didn't matter to us. So look at what the critiques are. See if they matter to you. After you've gone through that process, this is how we did, Stephanie, this is like really how we do this and how we find the best places. Follow up and do some crowdsourcing. That's tip number nine. What do we mean by that? So go into the RV Atlas Facebook group, really friendly, great group of folks from all over the country and ask, say, hey, we're thinking of staying here. We're a family of four with a dog, whatever, what, you know, like or we're um, a couple without kids and we don't really love all the screaming shenanigans, you know, like say what you're looking for and say, well, we were thinking about this place. Is this a good bet? People post like that all the time in the RV Atlas Facebook group and they get really good contextualized responses, right? People are like, or also seasonally people be like, oh, well, yeah, we were there, but we were there during this time and it, it, there was a deep freeze or, you know, like you just get so much good specific information that obviously we can't offer in a hundred word review in the book. That's the key point. Specific information. If you have some really specific question, like, Hey, I'm in a 40 foot Mm -hmm. fifth wheel. This uh, campground says it can accommodate me when this site, but I'm worried about making the turns and backing in. That's a great place to then go, you know, go to the RV Atlas group, go online and ask people. Tip 10. Um, You need to start learning and understanding how campground pricing works in and around national parks. Now, Stephanie, maybe I'll make this like overly simplistic. Getting right. <laughs> NPS campgrounds inside the park is dirt cheap, right? And chances are you won't have hookups. But yeah. it's 20 bucks, 30 bucks a night. They're, I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen an NPS campground that was $40 a night. But I'm sure, sure they're out there. Prices are affordable. Then the campgrounds that are private campgrounds in the gateway towns, generally speaking, for most national parks, particularly the most popular ones, tend to be expensive. Mm-hmm. Well, they're economics. They have to make money. I hate to, to break it to you, but the National Park campgrounds are subsidized by our tax dollars. So you're not actually paying the price of how much it costs to upkeep and maintain that campground, right? Like that's part of, I love the fact that we subsidize national parks, but that is a subsidy. And also, yeah, it's cheap, but you can't get it half the time, right? It's competitive mm-hmm. and you can't always get it. So supply and demand there is kind of like weird, right? It's very cheap and everybody's going for it. So you may not be able to get it. Now enter these private campground owners outside capitalism at its finest. They have something that's valuable for people and they have a very small window of time. A lot of the time at a lot of our national parks are not year round locations. They have a small window of time when they can capitalize on being able to make the money that they need to stay in business. So a lot of them will charge the price they have to pay to make their three-month high season work for their business. 
I think the economics make sense. I'm never puzzled by the price of campgrounds in and around national parks ever. People complain about the prices like at that West Glacier yeah. KOA. And it, look, it's expensive. They have three months to make hay. I mean, they have four months to make hay or else that, their business yeah. model does not make sense. And they're going to sell it and somebody's mm-hmm. going to build condos there. Uh, another thing you said was interesting, too. What happens to a lot of people, I think particularly newer RV owners or less experienced campers, is they say, oh, I want to go to Yellowstone. I want to go to Yosemite. I want to go to Grand Canyon. And I want to camp inside the parks. But everything's sold out. And then you just quickly move to the private campgrounds outside of the park. Uh, I think you know, that's happened to us, too. Um, yeah. So, again, get on it early. Tip number 11, you also need to understand that dynamic pricing is now at play in the private campgrounds outside of the parks, almost universally, maybe not universally, mm-hmm. but at most places. So, Stephanie, can you just quickly break down what people need to know about how dynamic pricing works? Yeah. So now campgrounds, more and more campgrounds are operating on like that, like a hotel model where if you put in dates, it's maybe a Tuesday through a Thursday, you may get a very low price of $50 or something. And then all of a sudden that same campsite will be $70, $80, $90 on Friday, Saturday night because the demand, right? So this is the case now. A lot of people will say their campsite is actually differently priced over the course of a week. You'll see this if you go and book where like it's actually a different price every night of the week because of this dynamic pricing. And they'll tell you the average price per night now on mm-hmm. campgrounds. Right. Because they'll like then loop it all together for you at the end. So anyway, you just need to be prepared that if you're incredibly price sensitive, you need to be looking to your shoulder seasons. You need to be looking to your midweek away from holidays, you know, all of those tricks that you would normally pull in any other accommodations you have to do with campgrounds now too. Okay. Tip number 12, we gave you eight times already. Okay. Book early, book (laughs) early, book early. All right. We've got a lot more tips to give you and we're going to go inside the parks now, or we're going to move into the um, vacation part of this, right? That was the pre-planning part. Now we're going to give you some tips uh, for things to do when you're actually there enjoying your trip. But before we do so, we have a sponsored message from our friends at Camco. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I am here with Stephanie, and we are giving you 35 tips for taking RV trips to national parks. We just gave you tips for pre-planning a national park trip. Now we're going to give you some tips for the time you actually spend in and around the national parks. So tip 13, start at the visitor center. That's like a classic Stephanie tip. I think a lot of veteran RV owners and national parks visitors do this. Why is it so important? Yeah, so, well, because you've done all your research, you've read our recommendations, you've read other people's recommendations, and then you show up and there may be very specific things that are operating that day, that week in the park that our book couldn't tell you or our podcast about that national park couldn't tell you. And this is why visitor centers are always staffed with rangers or volunteers for the the park that really know the current conditions. They know that the trail you've been planning on hiking for the last three months is closed for bear activity, right? Like those kinds of things are critical, um, especially in your national parks that have a lot of wildlife activity. Um, They may know things like there's a washout or there's, um, hey, there may be a thunderstorm rolling in later on or something like that in the afternoon. All of these things, the rangers, when you say to them, hey, we were thinking of doing this. Is there something you would recommend? They're really good at that. It just gives you a a context. A lot of the time they have those nice maps and those rays, you know, like um, little demonstrations that can get your kids really in. Um, Another reason, which I know is on our list, but it's later. So we'll talk about it a little later is you pick up all your stuff for the junior ranger program. But I know that's later. too. It's coming later. Now, look, you could drive for two hours get to a trailhead and discover it's closed if you don't do this. Like when we went to Badlands National Park, they had a whiteboard when you walk in. You don't even have to talk to a ranger. They have like a whiteboard and a ranger wrote in marker like this trail is closed. You know, this trail is flooded. Um, When we were in Glacier, we did the hidden lake hike and you could only go so far before they shut down the hike because there had been bear activity. But we knew that before we went and we're just like, okay, we'll just do the shorter version of the hike. So you can make some really time-wasting mistakes if you don't sort of check into headquarters as it were. The next step, and this is also maybe you could call this pre-planning, but or you could do it on your first night or, or day there. 
check out all the safety guidelines for that park on the National Park Service website. Almost every national park has a section of their website that tells you about dangers and risks. It's, it's kind of like, like, here's all the ways you can die in this park. Yeah. Right. And it's, it's actually not just like bears. It's actually quite different for different types of parks mm-hmm. or different types of danger. So you're, you're out in nature and you have to read this page. You have to go here. It is your responsibility to do this. Stephanie, I will never forget going to Yellowstone and hiking. It wasn't Grand Prismatic Springs, but it was somewhere in that area. And the guy was letting his dog drink water off the side of the boardwalks. And we're like, oh, my God, y- I you know, you almost can't do that. lost it on this guy. I was like, how it's like, ch- like, it's like animal cruelty to like be allowing your dog. It was just terrible. And I was like, this is just how stupid people are. But every single national and Yellowstone's an obvious one. But every national park has its weird things like rock slides or, you know, and or um, tornadoes uh, alerts, right, that you need to be aware of or um, extreme heat. Yeah, like whatever it is, you need to know, like, what are the things that you have to be aware of in that national park? It's not Disney World. It is protected nature, which means they are allowing dangers to exist because they're natural. (laughs) So this is not a curated environment for you. You have to be careful. And in in most cases, if there's a sign that's like, don't swim here or don't hike off the trail here, that is probably because bad things have happened when people have Mm -hmm. done that. Weirdly enough, though, the NPS is really not fond of swimming, though. You know, like they really like don't seem (laughs) to want you to swim. (laughs) I don't, don't I need, need to research liability. this more. Just like the number of places we've been, we're like, you could swim there. And it's like, don't swim there. Um, but yeah, if it says don't swim there, there, don't swim there. All right. Tip 15, avoid crowded spots at busy times. You, This is so important. Like, I want to go back to Acadia National Park right now this summer. I'm hoping we can go back. Maybe we will. Maybe we won't. But I want to go back. If we do, I'm not doing the Park Loop Road on Saturday or Sunday. We'll go to Scudic yeah. Peninsula on Saturday or Sunday. And we'll do the Park Loop Road on Monday. I mean, sometimes it's yeah. just as simple as like reversing the things that you want to do. Don't go on a, on a weekend to the most popular spots in the park and then be annoyed there's a crowd. All right. Try to work around the weekends and do more popular things during the week. Is it just that simple? Yeah, because there's always every park has three or four of the most visited places in the park. And every single tour bus stops there between the hours of like 10 and 2. Don't be the person who goes there at that time and then complains about how crowded national parks are. Like, always plan your off the beat and track stuff during those peak late morning, early afternoon hours. Um, and then go to those popular spots early in the morning or later in the day. That's tip 16. It's one of our best tips ever. Get up early and go. Podcast listeners, it is amazing how many Americans go to national parks and sleep in. If that's you, I'm not criticizing you. A lot of our listeners and correspondents and people we know, just your family sleep in. Our family sleeps in now on Saturday and Sunday, oh, but yeah. not if we're at Yellowstone, not if we're at Glacier. You know, yeah, some, we're, look, we're dragging Max and Theo kicking and screaming out of bed at this point, but it is so worth it to get in that hike or go to that popular destination, uh, whatever it might be. So so get up early, even if that's not your family's like natural thing to do. I think that's fair to say, right? Oh, a hundred percent. That in Disney at Disney, I'm like no joke. It is out of bed and go because the difference in the experience that you have early in the morning and just a couple hours later is so tremendous. So I'm really strict about this, and <laughs> we get up and we go. <laughs> Hashtag Disney mom who won't admit she's a Disney mom. All right, let's move on. Okay. <laughs> Tip number seventeen. Disney is not the topic here. Pack tons of snacks and water and coffee because a lot of the national <laughs> look in Yellowstone. We were so smart. If we you made drink coffee, it, <laughs> if you drink it, if you don't drink it, bring it anyway. In Yellowstone, we knew we weren't going to be able to get coffee in the park or it'd be really hard to. So we put coffee in our Yeti mugs and then we had hot coffee for a few hours. That was very important to me, maybe less important to you. But, but <laughs> yeah. when, we, when we did Yellowstone, like, and I keep bringing up Yellowstone. But that's just a good case. Like you can get hours into the park and there's no cliff bars around for sale. So just having a cooler in the car or having a bunch of snacks in the backpacks, really, really smart. 
Yeah, Yellowstone is just an extreme example of a lot of lessons that you learn in national parks over, you know, the time and traveling with them. But in general, national parks are just not good at providing great food options. There's some exceptions out there, but for the most part, you know, you don't have snack stands everywhere. And it is one of the things that just can ruin, you know, your an hour. You're far away. You got there. And if everybody's hangry, you're going to want to leave and you're going to uh, like not have this great experience that you had. Whereas if you have a full, and we always do, a full cooler, like grapes, granola, like snacks, chips, cookies, like just jam your car full of food and drink for the day. And you'll never have to say we have to leave this sunset or this amazing view or this hike because people are hungry. That's important. There are some places in the national parks that do have good snack and food options. Coulter Bay Village, I'm looking at you with your Starbucks I know. coffee and your good pizza. I, that's what I was saying. I don't want to like, yes, I know that they're out there, but I, I think that that is the exception, not the rule. Oh, totally. Okay, tip number 18. And this has been a major part of my personal national park experience that I've loved so much and some of my best memories in the parks. Attend the amphitheater talks, the interpretive walks, and the ranger programs. And I'm going to add on to this tip a little bit. I don't know if you'll agree with me, with, with, with Stephanie. We particularly do these things when your kids are young. Okay. I'm not saying that like Max and Theo don't want to go to a ranger talk anymore, but they definitely were more excited about it when they were younger, the, that this type of programming, or now they want adventure, you know, nonstop adventure, as opposed to something like this, it's a little bit more educational. Um, so do those things, get the schedule, go to the amphitheater. I've only been to one bad ranger talk out of about 50. Do you remember which one? I'm not going to sell out this ranger talk. Yes, I will. <laughs> what oh, my was God. It? The ranger talk in Glacier National Park at St. Mary Campground uh, was, like, I, uh, yeah. mystical and new age and weird and crazy. And, it, well, I don't know. I didn't learn anything. Okay. Like, I, I don't bear really... safety tips. I remember being there, but I, like, I remember sitting in that amphitheater, but obviously I was just tuned out and I really wasn't paying attention to. It was the, your idea talk. to leave early that night. Oh, well, then it was probably really bad. <laughs> but yeah, I... I just think that they, um, you can learn about things that you never knew you wanted to learn, which is really fun too. And the boys remember, like, when you're, you expose your little kids to this, they remember, like, learning about the weasels in oh, sleeping you know sleeping bear dunes yeah like they'll remember certain things like that that'll come up for years and years just it contextualizes the place around you so these are these are just great to attend tip number 19 i give you credit for making our family do this because it's not always easy in the moment but it's no you worth hate it, it. you are no, always like oh there's people it. i don't want to stand in line you hate standing in line like if a bunch of people are doing it you don't want anything to do with it but i agree with this tip <laughs> Always get the picture by the National Park sign. Yeah. And yes, it can be hard to park. Yes, there can be a line of people. Yes, it can be, kind of feel annoying, but I do love those pictures. Thank you, Stephanie, for making us. That's right. That's why we do them. <laughs> Tip number 20, get the kids educated and excited before you go. Um, can you give like an example of how we've yeah, done that? Sure. This is like, we were both have teaching backgrounds and this was just pulling from that pre-teaching kind of thing that you always do as a teacher before you go on a class trip or whatever. Like we have so many resources at our disposal now with streaming and everything like with YouTube, you can get your kids so excited about visiting a place. It's not going to spoil it for them. It's going to get them hyped up and ready. So watching, like we watched so many documentaries and YouTube videos before we went to Yellowstone, right? Or anytime we're trying to take them to a place that they've never heard of and they're like, what are you talking about? This doesn't sound, you know, like a really like great shakes. We start showing the, the, them the places and they get really excited about it. So books, YouTube, documentaries, all that stuff, it really helps them hype up to that. I mean, we do this with every kind of vacation, so... YouTube works wonders for this, you know, mm -hmm. it really type is. in. And then once they get into that algorithm, the algorithm starts feeding it to them. So it's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> All right. Tip 21. And, you know, like a lot of our podcast listeners are totally into this. This is no secret anymore. Participate in the Junior Ranger program. And then we sort of have a handful of, of sub tips because it's not it's not quite as simple as just like showing up. You know, it can be. Yeah. But, 
Yeah, it's not. I actually don't think it is. I think some sometimes it's – I love the Junior Ranger program, but I don't necessarily think it's super family-friendly. Sometimes I think it can be like – so if you just show up and you get the booklet without doing a little advanced research, which is one of like our sub-tips here, you might be surprised by what it's asking you to do or like Kate to Patterson, find a program. National Seashore, Stephanie's looking at you. Yeah, like that was not – kid friendly like we were trying to teach our kids how to love these things and do these programs and the guy's like i don't know if he filled out this booklet i'm like he's four he, he like of like course failing, he did he it. like was failing wesley he was like <laughs> crossing out his answers <laughs> like i'm like dude you need to go back to ranger school and revisit the whole concept of this but yeah just know what you're getting into and like a lot of the time you can see the ba- the books online and you can see what's going on so that also i would recommend going to get the booklets before you do anything Sometimes we've gone gotten the booklets too late and then we went, oh, well, we went there, but we didn't know you were supposed to do this scavenger hunt while you were there. So like just get it right when you're done. If you can get it off the internet in advance, that's even easier. Um, do the swearing in ceremony, take pictures, make it a big deal with your kids. Um and like get something to store. I think their badges. We never we did we're not good at that. The badges are all over the place. Oh, like if you get something early on, a pin, you know, a towel, something like that that they they keep it on a backpack. I think that that'll help like build that anticipation and excitement. And then also there's some aspects of them that you can do from home. Maybe that was more of a, you know, height of covid thing, but again, you get information on the websites and you'll find out what you need to know to do it. Or maybe you can do some parts of it while you're at home. Okay. So those, oh no, we got more. Tip 26. Shoes, <laughs> hikes. No, no, but I thought we were ready for commercial break. Not quite We're yet. still in the kids section. Yeah. We're not ready for the, the next break. We're still 26 in the kids section. 26 is yeah. again a Stephanie tab. Choose hikes that lead to big payoffs. And I have occasionally messed up here. In terms of choosing hikes that are just like deeply wooded forest hikes. They're just walking in the woods, dude. Just Just walking walking in in the woods. woods. That is not something a lot of kids want to do. Yeah. You want water. You want mountain views. You want a hill to, you know, you're thinking the dunes and sleeping bear dunes. Like you want a hill to barrel down. Whatever it is, rock scrambles. If you want your kids to want to hike, which is a common national park activity. And it's common for parents to be struggling to get their kids to want to hike. Make sure you show them that there's some big payoffs that will be fun along the way. Just a little encouragement if your kids complain about hiking, because our kids have complained about hiking, to be honest oh. with you. They've definitely complained. Um, they they do tend to really enjoy the hike, though, <laughs> even if they don't yeah. want to admit if it. If you it's can wor- get past, it's worth, yeah. It's worth, bar- God, this is just parenting advice in general. It's worth barreling through the kids' complaints about things to get to the result you want. And it's that, brutal, but it's worth it. It's brutal, but it's worth it. And sometimes you want to, you know, give up, but push through to have the trips that you want to have as a parent and the, you know, give the kids the experiences you want them to have. Don't let them rule the camper. Okay. Yeah. And that kind of leads into the next one, which is slow down and soak in the beauty. Like, Also, don't push your kids too hard. Like, yes, make them do things that they may complain about, like a hike if you want to do it. But also, kids can really burn out. And when we just drag them from one thing to the next and pack as many possible things into an itinerary, and they're just exhausted and overstimulated, it can really wreck the fun. Like, be respectful of their limits. You have them, right? Like that's the thing I always think of. As adults, we get burnt out and like, oh my gosh, imagine these little kids that are like, what? I think Being that's the home. real problem is that we burn out but don't want to be honest with it because we still mm-hmm. want to do this hike and do that thing and do that thing, but we're burnt out and then our kids get burnt out and then we're annoyed at our kids for being burnt out when we're really burnt out as well. Yeah, so that you leads don't in- need to do everything ever. You don't. You just don't. That's been so important. It's been so important for us to be able to go to a a major national park, go to Redwoods, go to Olympic, and really relieve ourselves of the burden of trying to do everything. I would way rather slow down, and that leads into the next tip, tip 27, slow down and soak in the beauty. I'd rather not get to everything and really enjoy the things I am doing because I really do feel like I'll I'll come back someday. You know, and maybe in some cases I won't. But I feel like look, if I if I leave 
and I really feel like I didn't do things I want to do, I'll come back. Uh, so slow down and, and enjoy yourself. Yeah, and that's like in one day, slow down, don't jam everything, but also schedule like recovery days and downtime at the campground is tip 28 because that's another thing that we've realized is if we, even though we're in Glacier and you want to get every single second out of it, we're like, okay, if we, and, and sometimes we still did something on those days that we marked as like down days, but we actually build in like what we call pool days or beach days for our kids when we're traveling, um, even to amazing places, because we're like, we know that nobody will be happy if we just don't give ourselves time to sit and recover and enjoy the view. And I could make the case here that recovery days are better at the private campgrounds outside the park that has the pool, that has the playground, that has the sports. After we did the Grinnell Glacier hike, which was an eight hour hike, and what was it, 12 miles? The next day, we planned nothing. We relaxed at the campground, and that was yeah. such a good decision. I don't remember what we did that day, to be honest with you, but I know we needed that day. And then we were able to do the avalanche uh, lake hike the next day. So it might, for a lot of you, it might seem crazy to plan a day off on vacation, but having a strategic day off on vacation, I think, is really, really important. Okay, tip 29. Sign up for every kid outdoors if you have a fourth grader. Stephanie, if people are not familiar with this program, can you just give us the quick overview? Yeah, it used to be called Every Kid in a Park. So some of you might be like, wait a minute, I've never heard of that. It was the Every Kid in a Park. It's been rebranded um, to Every Kid Outdoors and every fourth grader in the country. If you go on the website, you can download, they can complete a little registration form. Here's the thing that I hate about this program. You must do it online and print out the certificate before you go. You cannot have it on your phone. I feel like this creates an accessibility barrier that makes me very unhappy. And um, I'd like to talk to the person who decided that somebody had to print this out because I'm like, how many people don't even own printers anymore, <laughs> right? Like, so this bothers me, but I'm giving you fair warning. You have to print it out and then bring it and you get um, a pass for the entire year. Now, it's not for things that like have additional fees, like Mount Rushmore, you have to pay for parking. This is not going to cover that, but this is going to cover like the entry fee for almost for just tons of the sites um, in the country and also for their family if they're if they're with them. So it's a really great program. Don't miss out on that window. Um, kids are expensive. So every once in a while, if they can give us free entry to a national park, yay them. <laughs> they're so expensive. They're so expensive. Okay. We still have some tips left. We have one more segment left. It's a shorter segment. And it is specifically about tips for visiting national parks with your pets, okay? So this is important if you're bringing along a pet to your national park vacation. Before we give you those remaining five or six tips, we have a sponsored message from our friends at Go RVing. Welcome back to the show, everybody. We are now talking about tips for visiting national parks with pets. And Stephanie, I will admit, I let you carry the mental load. For bringing Maggie <laughs> for everything along. in life. Oh wait, no, no, we're just talking about pets now. Okay, that's a different podcast. Let's not okay, go there. <laughs> just, no, but you. I mean, look, you you do when we leave Maggie behind, which is very rarely. You 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 know you deal with that, and but then everyone always wants to bring her on vacation, so we've really tried to bring her on vacation, yeah. and we have brought her to, on these great national park trips. So what what do we need mm -hmm. to know? Do your it's yeah. the tip twenty thirty or whatever is do your research. Yeah, 30 is just do your research. Never, ever, ever show up to any national park without having fully researched the pet situation at them. Every single national park is wildly different with their pet friendly um, accessibility. Whether, the, whether because, you, you can hike with them or bring them on a beach or whatever it might be. And even at different times of the year. So every park will have maybe seasons because this is an issue of protecting the land and the wildlife. So if there are birds that nest in a certain part of the park during a certain time of the year, dogs may be completely off limits for the majority of the park during that time of year. Every single park is different and you really have to research, never show up. And this is, you know, this is an issue of like, if you always travel with your dog, which we mostly do, Maggie's great. You need to know that you're, you're going to have to make plans in advance sometimes and you're going to have to be flexible with what you do based on that choice to travel with your dog yeah so I you feel know, like definitely the, do your research in advance 
And I feel like the NPS could do a little bit of a better job of having real clarity on the, the park websites about like where just having it in one area, like where dogs are allowed, where they're I not allowed. So I feel like it's buried. They sometimes. do. I think they've made, pro- I will say, I think they made progress there. Like they do with the safety. There's like the dog, especially with the bark ranger program. I think that that's been, you know, developed in order to help people navigate the different. Well, that was one of, that was one program. of your tips was to check out the bark yeah. ranger program. So that stands for, Bag your pet's waste, always leash your pet, respect wildlife, know where you can go. And so, yeah, so maybe you're right. Maybe they have made some progress in detailing that more and making it a a bit more easy for travelers to figure these things out. Tip 32, plan for your pet's safety at the campsite. So what are some things to consider? Yeah, Um, really consider where you're staying in relation to your pet's comfort. So for example, At Cedar Pass Campground, you mentioned that campground before, we knew that we had to get a site with electric, not a prettier site on the perimeter that was dry, even though we were fine with dry camping because we had a dog and we knew that she would need air conditioning. So that is something that it's like, yeah, would we love to dry camp in the middle of nowhere during the summer? Sure. We are not, we are not air conditioning people. We're fine. We have a dog. And we have to put her first in this. And we literally chose a campsite based on that. And you really have to consider your pets if you're going to camp with them in terms of temperature. You also need to consider um, whether the campground has any restrictions, right? We're not going to debate the bully breed restrictions. Campgrounds have them, whatever you think about that, right? So make sure that you have all of your paperwork in line and all you've read any campground policies about that in advance. Tip number three is plan for your pet safety while you're in the park too. So if you're, you know, you're bringing your dog into the park, maybe you have a, a hike planned or something like that. You you need to think about some of the same issues, right? Not just uh, for the time yeah. at the campsite, but also the time in the national park. Yeah. Again, temperatures. You have to think about your pet's feet, right? In a way, you've got shoes on. Your pet doesn't, right? So this is something like um, Sand Dunes National Park. You cannot be hiking those dunes during the middle of the day with your pet. They could really burn, you know, during this, like they can burn their feet. So these are things that if you go to places like the website, they'll have a lot of these like alerts, right? So that you can think about it. Also hydration, all those things you're thinking, I'm going on a hike. I need to bring enough water for me. Yeah. You need to bring enough water for your dog too. And especially if you get stuck or whatever. So you have to plan for your dog like they are a member of the family. Can they if do you're the going hike? To be exploring. Yeah, you know, like Maggie has oh. hiked all over the place with us in Acadia, but that was now many years yeah. ago. And I was thinking recently, mm-hmm. like she might not be able to handle some of the hikes that she did when she was younger. So we do have to think of yeah. her like a member of the family. You know, can we take her on this hike? Like I remember doing the Gora Mountain Trail and saying, "Oh, we're going to go the easy, this easier way here, as opposed to going the harder way where there's more of a scramble." Um, yeah. Tip number 34, and this is coming from somebody who has been bitten by a dog at a campground, me, Mm. always Mm -hmm. leash your dog. Isn't isn't the rule always like the six-foot leash, not these like massive retractable leashes that let your dogs kind of wander all over the place? Those retractable leashes can be so incredibly dangerous on on hiking trails with people. Like if a dog like ropes or like pushes someone with one of those. Um, The National Park has very strict six foot leash rules and you need to follow it. This is not, we have like the best behaved dog in the world. Okay. I know what it's like to have a dog who would never leave it. Her recall, like she has no desire to be anywhere except with our family. I have no problems. We can do entire hikes with her off leash. She's fine. You don't get to make that decision. It's not your national park. The National Park has the rule to leash your dogs, and you have to. (laughs) So, I mean, we just had an experience like this in the Smokies where some dude thought he was above the rules and his dog didn't have to. That dog, who this guy thinks is probably amazing, 
was like lunging and growling at people as they walked by on this really narrow path. But the dog to wasn't even allowed on the trail to begin with. And then it was off no, leash. No, like you should never be putting anybody in that situation. I don't care what you think about your dog. As coming from somebody who has an incredibly friendly, wonderful dog, like who should be on a farm running off leash her entire life. Yeah, you need to put your dog on a leash. We're dog lovers. And by that, mm. I mean, we love our dog. Do you know what I'm saying? We love our dog. <laughs> Maggie, we're Maggie I lovers. I don't necessarily <laughs> love your dog. Yeah. And I think that a lot of yeah. dog owners think that everyone wants to be licked and approached by their dog. Um, mm -hmm. That's not And like case. I, as a mother, have to be making a decision about whether your dog is trustworthy with my kids. No, I do not want to make that decision. And then people always say, know. oh, my dog's friendly. Well, that's what somebody said before I got bit by a dog at a campground. Um, yeah, tip yeah, 35 and I don't want tip 35 is, is tip number 35 is always clean up after your dog and I don't want to end on this like this sort of like negative note um, but of course clean up after your dog is tip number 35 you just do that everywhere but particularly in our beautiful national parks I feel like we need to give like a bonus tip tip 36 to end on a positive note I mean okay. I can <laughs> can you I can think quickly, of one <laughs> I'll quickly add a tip um, okay don't tip number 36 and I'll give, I'll give two. Tip okay. number 36. It, if you're hearing about all the overcrowding at national parks like yeah, yeah. Yellowstone, Zion, et cetera, et cetera, here's two tips that will help you approach that. Tip number 36, bonus tip. Well, find an off-the-beaten-track national park that's also amazing because there's lots of them, and they're in Where Should We Camp Next National Parks, right? Uh, if you don't want to deal with big crowds, then, then there are national parks that are not that crowded. They're really, truly out there. Or tip number 37, go to that dream park. If it's your dream to go to Acadia National Park, don't let some news story about overcrowding at Acadia National Park yeah. keep you away from a dream park you want to visit. We wanted to visit Yellowstone. We heard about all the crowding. We picked a good time to go at the end of August, and we got up early, and we were smart about where we went and when we went there. If you want to go to the dream park and the dream park's crowded, you need to do more homework and research than normal. So there's the a dream bonus park tips. is crowded at four places for six hours a day. Maybe not even every day of the week. Maybe even <laughs> yeah. not every day of the week. <laughs> yeah, Tuesday's a quiet day in the park. Tuesdays, I almost any park we've been to, Tuesdays and Wednesdays are so nice. And then you see the crowds coming in on Friday. You're like, oh, that's what it's like, right? Like even the most crowded parks, I would say maybe Yosemite is like outside of maybe Yosemite feels like it is like jam packed during I, not, the entire I summer. In, I don't, yeah, in this entire summer, but also go off season if you. But can. in the winter, yeah, it's empty. It's like shoulder very, season. Deep. National park visits are awesome. I mean, if you have yeah. a family in school, that gets tricky, but it's still possible, right? Um, so don't yeah. let anybody tell you not to go to your dream park because of the crowds, but also know there's other options. And then my last tip, tip number 38, uh, can you please grab a copy of Where Should We Camp Next National Parks? Um, it's available oh. for pre-order right now. And on Tuesday, hey, it'll Hey, can I say, because you didn't say this at the beginning of the episode, if the podcast comes out on Friday, if you're listening to it right away, you still have a few days to pre-order to get the freebies. But you had to fill out the form. So there's a sticker and there's a packing list. A digital packing and list. Yeah. And so you could still go in, pre order, fill out the form, which I'm sure is in our Facebook group, right? I'll or... put it in the show notes to this episode okay. on the RVAtlas.com. I'll put it up yeah. at the top because this is going to be a long post filled with all these tips. Okay. So, so you still have a couple of these to get your pre, pre order goodies. And I want to thank everybody who's purchased any of our books. Um, I dreamed of writing books when I was a little kid. And, you know, when we're writing and publishing books, it's really, really exciting. And, um, you know, we wouldn't be able to write the next book if people weren't buying the previous book. So um, you guys are making this possible for us by purchasing they these cut books. cut us off. <laughs> well, really, if your book doesn't sell, it's hard. I mean, it's not impossible. You don't get more. <laughs> they say, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no like, more yeah, books for you. Write another book. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it. And, uh, we hope that we see all of you at the campground. We'll see you at the campground. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the RV Atlas. 
To find out more about the topics discussed on this show, head on over to the RVAtlas.com. And to join the friendliest group of RVers, head on over to the RV Atlas group on Facebook and make sure to join us on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at the RV Atlas. If you enjoy our show, please consider leaving us a review over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And we will see you at the campground. See you at the campground.